Hey guys, Chris Kugler here. Uh, last time we left off, we were building our system for unlocking skills. And uh, in, in doing that, I noticed a few little odds and ends I want to fix with my enemy spawn location. And in addition, we need to kind of work a little bit more on the unlocking skill screen. So what we had when we left off, we had started off with a player menu and it has a script for navigation that launches a couple of different screens and at the moment we only have the one which is this uh, screen that has navigation via the controller and mouse and we can unlock skills it has a prerequisite system so you can't unlock a skill that whose prerequisite has not been met uh, it cost experience points which you can see in the bottom left of the screen to unlock a skill and once I've unlocked it it switches to a different UI style and the, um, the next tier of skill becomes available, and so on and so forth. Now, this doesn't allow for more skills than are on the screen right now. So imagine a scenario where this list of skills maybe goes down, or we have another row of, uh, yeah, another row of skills and needs to go further down. We need to be able to navigate down through all of these, as well as going off of the screen and having it pan. So that's one of the problems we're going to be solving today. Uh, first and foremost, though, uh, in building, in messing around with my enemy spawner, I have a. Let me find it here in the in the hierarchy. We have a spawn activator which has a collider on it, and this collider acts as both the radius within which enemies can travel. So you see they only go, can only go a certain amount outside, and if it's detected they are outside, they're gonna head back towards the center to kind of remain in this region. And if, um, if the player goes out of this region, though, all the enemies disable. And this was kind of an optimization step to make sure that if the player's like all the way on the other side of the map, I don't just have these guys running around taking up CPU cycles uh, you, with their AI behavior and their uh, collision, their um, physics checks and things like that. So the problem being then that as soon as I step outside, or rather it's on a trigger enter and exit, so now that I'm in the trigger, oops, escape, once I exit you can see they disappear which is obviously not what I want. So what we really need is we need a secondary uh, trigger collision on a more ex uh, at a further radius. So when we leave this like this curvature section, the enemies within here are deactivated. And then when we come back in, their AI is reactivated. So I think that's the first thing I'm going to take care of here before moving back into the skill system. And this is a pretty easy thing to fix. So really, I've got my spawn. I need a new empty game object. And I want this to be... So I'm going to have this be at the same position as my other spawn. And I'm going to make him a child. Yeah, child at zero, zero, zero. And that one I'm happy with. So this guy has a sphere collider, and he has a rigid body. Now, when, when you have the rigid body alongside the sphere collider, and this is a is trigger is kinematic situation, only scripts that are attached to this game object will detect the trigger events. If I didn't have a rigid body on here, the, the sphere collision checks would occur on both it and any children it might have. So it's very important if you don't want those events to be handled by children that you also include a rigid body with your sphere collider. So I'm going to add another sphere collider here and I'm going to add a, another rigid body is kinematic so that it doesn't participate in normal physics calculations. It treats the rigid body as if it's, um, well, the intent is that it's part of a joint from just the definition of kinematic. 
that as part of a joint, it itself doesn't react to any physics. It's part of more of a complex motion. For instance, uh, moving your wrist doesn't necessarily mean you're moving the rest of your, of your arm. But moving your arm means you're moving your wrist. So in Unity's terminology, it kind of just tells it that this is part of a more complicated hierarchy and it doesn't need to really interact with the majority of physics operations. And combining that with the is trigger so that we also then don't have a situation where our player is bouncing off of the sphere. You know, we kind of create this situation where we can track the events, but we don't... Um, we're not participating in the world physics. And this guy is going to be spawn center now, and this guy is going to be spawn activator. Now, I've got toggle active on trigger collision is a script I wrote a while back that lets me have all these checkboxes to kind of control what situation I'm going to enable and disable objects in relation to the trigger. Enemy spawn location, I don't need to do anything with this. So let's take a quick look at this script. So I've got my applicable tag, which is going to be the tag with which I want to react. So in the, in the case in the editor here, case of the editor here, got a uh, player tag. So any resulting uh, execution is only going to happen if an object with the tag of player um, enters or exits the trigger. And you can see over here we've got our uh, checkboxes for, you know, are we going to enable the object when it enters or are we disabling on entry? Are we enabling on exit or disabling on exit. So we kind of get the full control of how we want our object to interact with the collider. And a few other options here as far as are we only changing properties on the current game object? Are we affecting the parent above this one? Are we affecting all the children? Which inherently, if you're affecting the self, you're also affecting the children by it through disabling or enabling but maybe we don't want to disable the current object, we only want to disable all of its children. So this just kind of gives us a little extra flexibility. Uh, some simple logic to make sure we've got the required information and we are at least participating in, it, or rather that we are not enabling and disabling on entry and no, we're not enabling and disabling on exit. You can only have one or the other for each, uh, for each trigger. Um, event. So and then we just handle the on trigger enter and on trigger exit and checking the uh, booleans we make and the tag of course we make sure that we're enabling and disabling the appropriate related objects. You know it's fairly straightforward but it's a little flexible. So I want to copy this component I'm going to go ahead and remove it, and I'm just going to go ahead and paste this object. Yeah, so we're going to, on when the player enters the collision, we're going to enable all the children. And actually, we are going to, yes, affect children only. And if we are going to leave, we're going to disable. Now, here is the problem, though. And actually, this isn't a problem because these things only occur when the player enters or exits. So as long as the player doesn't start off directly next to a spawn location and immediately affect the trigger, we're not going to prevent enemies from spawning in. So if we got our spawn location, our player's over here, and we have our spawn location here, until the player runs up, this thing needs to start off as active, so the spawning is actually occurring. And then when the player gets in, well, see, that's a problem, right? So these guys are then active if the player is not in the region. So this is a little bit of a tricky problem to solve. So enemy spawn location, we have our spawn radius.
So do I even need the collider on this? I mean, I'm only really using the collider to check the radius. I don't think there's actually any on-trigger enter or on-trigger exit going on inside of this spawner. It's just a matter of hanging onto the radius. Which actually, am I even using the collider in this case? Yeah, so I'm grabbing the radius from this guy. Enemy unit dot spawner radius. But I have this here. Yeah, I don't even need the collider for this. Really. And that just tells the... Um, That's so the AI knows how far it can travel from the from the center location. And if I know the radius, I can check my distance from the player. Alright, so let's do this. So back to back to my original thing. I'm gonna have one object. His position is correct. We're going to delete this guy. I'm going to re-add this thing. But we're going to up the radius. So since I'm going to use the spawn radius that's in the object... Oops. Damn OBS and not switching for me. I swear. All right, so in our spawn radius, we're gonna have, we're gonna use this value and our trigger, our collider is going to be like 1.5 times that. Yeah. Yeah, so when the player leaves or enters this, it's going to activate or disable the, uh, the child. However, I'm also going to add something here. So I've got my start. We loop over and we spawn all the enemies. Right? This is only going to occur if the, if the component is enabled. which the component itself is not going to disable. Its children are going to disable. Yeah, we're affecting only children. Yeah, so this guy remains active the entire time. So we start, we spawn all of our units. He updates. I don't need to do anything to this. Sadly, transform is a struct, so I can't have any um, extension methods. I don't believe you can, anyways. Can you do that? I've never actually tried. Um, yeah, okay. So you totally can do extension methods on a struct. Wonder why I hadn't uh, why I haven't done that before. Yeah, so if I do uh, this, transform T. Yeah. Oh, hot damn. Okay. Egg on... Oh, when I was already doing that. I don't know why I... Um, I don't know why I got it in my head that wasn't a capability. 
So I'm going to add a new extension method here. Public static void disable all children. Actually, we're just going to call this set active all children. As soon as we spawn all the enemy units, we'll disable all the children, leaving this current object active. If vector three dot distance this dot transform dot position player dot instance dot transform dot position is greater than or is greater than this dot spawn radius. No. This dot active radius. You know what? I don't need another property for that. If we're more than twice as far away from the radius, then deactivate all the children once we're done. So if we're starting off uh, you know, further on out, it'll spawn all the enemies, and then it will show that, uh, yeah, it'll just deactivate all the children once we're done. So let's go ahead and build. Actually, I need to really look at this in the scene. So first off, let's go and grab my player object and throw him way out. And yeah, so we can see that our spawn is here and all the children were spawned and disabled. And then when I bring my player in, You can see all the you can see all the children there activating and deactivating. And that movement's just all the uh, canvases that are child to the enemies turning to face the player because they're kind of billboard objects, or they're treated as billboards. Oops. Alright, so that's a problem solved. So we'll keep that at a short one, and I really need to figure out why... Oh, well, see there, now it's working. I don't understand this. Alright, so I was going to cut it short so I could figure out what's going on with OBS not switching automatically on me, but apparently that has just decided to start working again on its own. So, next item was going to be our... Um, our screen. So first off, a little experimentation. So if I've got my screen like this, what happens if I just make this larger than my canvas area? and I put a button down here. What happens when I navigate to that? Absolutely nothing happens. It navigates, but it doesn't do any kind of zooming. Now, there's a thing. This is the same way that in Unity we do the um, 
you do a scrolling object. Uh, Unity UI, I think it's called a scroll rect or something like that. Yeah, let's take a, I'm gonna take a quick look at the, I don't want the video menu, I want the manual. All right, so we're doing our scroll rect. We used when the content takes up a lot of space and needs to be displayed in a small area. Now I don't want a scroll bar. I just want it to kind of pan down my screen. So usually a scroll rect is combined with a mask in order to create a scroll view where only the scrollable content inside of the scroll rect is visible and it can additionally be combined with one or two scroll bars. All right, so we got the scroll rect component and it's got the content, which is gonna be the Okay, so this has this is parented to the object that's going to be scrolled. Yeah, reference to the rect transform of the UI element to be scrolled. Uh, whether we want horizontal, vertical, movement type, elastic. What's what's movement type here? Unrestricted, elastic, or clamped. Use elastic or clamp to force the content to remain within the bounds of the scroll rect. To force the content to remain within the bounds. Elastic mode bounces the content when it reaches the edge of the scroll rect. Okay. I think I'm going to have to experiment with this, but this sounds like it's the difference between, um, if you want to think like Legend of Zelda screen transition, right? So you get to the edge of the screen and then it automatically, it just immediately like zooms over into the next screen. You're either looking at one set of information or you're looking at the next. You're not looking at both. I think that's the difference between at least two of these, but I'm not sure what the difference between unrestricted and clamped would be. Elasticity is the amount of bounce. Uh, we have inertia, set the content will continue to move when the pointer is released after a drag. All right, and the viewport is reference to the viewport rect that is the parent of the content rect. And then here we have viewport rect, content rect, which it sounds like the content is a child of the viewport. Let's look at details here. Oh, actually, let's finish looking at this. So, yeah, the rest is just about the scroll bars, so I don't really care about that. On value changed is invoked when the scroll position of the scroll rack changes. Okay, sure. Details, the important elements of scroll view is the viewport, the scrolling content, and optionally one or two scroll bars. Root game object has the scroll rack component. The viewport has a mask component, which we'll come back to in a second. Viewport can either be the root game object or a separate game object that is child to the root. All the scrolling content must be children of a single content game object that is a child to the viewport. Okay. I don't care about setting up scroll bars. Yeah, so scroll view, viewport, content. And this guy will have the scroll rect, this guy has a mask, and this is just the content we're going to show. Okay. And what's it got to say about mask? Mask is not a visible UI, but rather a way to modify the appearance. Of course, that's the definition of a mask. What's the use of this in... Okay. You can achieve this first by making the image child of a panel. You should position the image so the area should be visible is directly behind the panel. Then add the mask component to the panel. The areas of the child image outside the panel will become invisible since they are masked. I see. Okay. All right. So this is more of a, for a situation where we're not looking at the whole screen. We're just looking at a portion. But either way, I'm going to, I'll go ahead and follow the process they say first, and then we'll, we'll experiment a little bit. So let's pop on over here. So we have our unlock skills a view rect, our viewport, and then the content. So this is the content to start with. Uh, so this is going to get a little tricky then with the way I have um, my navigation wired up. All right, so this guy's going to become unlock skills content, I think. And I need a empty object. All 
unlock skills. And this guy's a scroll wrecked. Zero, zero, center. Um, my sizing's all jacked, but let's go ahead and let me stretch zero, 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 zero. And this child is way too big now. So let's uh, snap him back in. Oops. And this is going to be the problem with uh, dealing with some of these things. Is since I'm reparenting stuff, my my sizes are going to get messed up. Yeah, and this guy still has that down there. So scroll wrecked has a, it can scroll vertically and horizontally, movement type elastic. We'll go ahead and stick with that for the moment. Uh, my viewport. I mean, technically this is going to be my viewport as well, I believe, if I understood this correctly. It, it implied that I should have a child object. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see. I think I see. So I need a new empty object. And the way they're kind of putting this is viewport content, yes. So this game object is also going to be stretch zero, 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 zero. He is now going to be a child of this. Viewport. Yeah. Okay, those transforms look okay. Viewport is supposedly going to have a mask, but I'm going to try this. Um, oh no, you know what? I, I said I'd follow the tutorial. Show mask graphic true. And this guy wants to know what is my viewport. And he wants to know what is my content. And let's just, um, you know, let's just see what happens here. Well, first off, this guy needs to be enabled. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, sure. So viewport enabled this thing. So when I enable or disable, it's going to enable this guy. as a whole. And the rest of these children are going to become enabled. So let's just see what happens. So pop this guy up and he exploded hard. All sorts of errors. What are we yelling about? Object reference not set to an instance of an object. Maskable graphic. All right. What do you got to tell me about maskable graphic? Usually, this, usually a scroll rect is combined with a mask in order to create a scroll view. How do I use a mask, though? Well. Tell you what, I wasn't sure if I actually needed this, so. Actually, I was just going to disable that use mask graphic thing and see if that, no. Okay, a little more experimentation. Let's remove that.
Okay, so I, I can navigate with my mouse. Oh boy. All right, well let's let's fiddle a little bit while we're in the uh, while we're running. Uh, horizontal disabled. Yeah, it only lets me scroll vertically. I do not want to go that far. Um, well, let's experiment with movement type. So elastic has this rubber banding. Unrestricted. Oh. Shit. Okay. So that means I just lost everything. Elastic will snap it back into place. That's good. So unrestricted is definitely not what I want. Clamped is just going to let me scroll up and down. That's that's more what I want. Inertia. Okay, so that's a very explicit. Yeah, the controller focus doesn't cause it to move is the problem. And then with inertia, if I just grab and flick, it's probably just going to slide down. Yeah. So I don't know if the clicking is picking up on my audio here, but I am just kind of giving it a little flick like you would to your phone, and it's kind of, it's still moving. Um, yeah, we'll say no to inertia. Because quite frankly, um, my scroll wheel also works to navigate, though the um, scroll sensitivity is probably... Yeah, that's a little bit better. Does that affect my... Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Okay, so scroll sensitivity seems to be explicitly for the scroll wheel. My movement here is... It's about an inch. That's about a... It's about an inch. Yeah, so that doesn't affect my click and drag. It just affects my... Um, usage of the scroll wheel, which I'm fine with. But the real problem, the real problem is the, um, the navigation of the controller is not pulling the viewport. Otherwise, though, I'm surprised that worked uh, so smoothly the first time. So I need to uncheck horizontal and I need to make this clamped and set the scroll visibility or set the scroll thing to so horizontal, clamped, no inertia, 20. Now, how do I get my event system to change the, to scroll my viewport? Do a little, uh, little googling, see what I can find. Yeah, I bet I'm gonna have to do this in code. It doesn't look like there's anything in the editor that's going to um, automatically switch. So. So what's actually happening here in the scene when I do this? So if I look at my scene, my viewport is still there. My full content's changed. I'm betting the viewport just slides down, but the parent remains unchanged. It acts as kind of a, um, uh, not a pivot, but somewhat similar. So let's uh, slide this down just a little bit. Go back to the scene, and yeah, you can kind of see this. So really, I need to detect the navigation change, and I can, in code, move this down until the, until the transform is in view. But let me take a, another swing through here real quick. And what about my event system? Does it have anything to say about this? No, I don't have anything. Uh, all right, internet. 
Do you have anything to say about this? Okay, so yeah, it's, it seems like that's kind of the deal, is it doesn't natively support snapping to, uh, to focus with the gamepad. So I'm going to need to capture the appropriate events and set and code the rec transform for the viewport. So, let's go ahead and set my controller aside for the moment. And let's take a let's take a peek what we got here. So I need first off I need to know about the selection changed of any of these buttons. And there should be an event for that. I believe there's an event for that anyways. Is it like on selected or something like that? There we go. There's there's what I want. Apply style. Button dot select on select. On select is what I want to have fire. Side of selectable. Really, there's no nothing I can add here. Can I just handle the event on the button object? Well, no. So I don't want to. I don't like that. I don't want to do that. I thought event system had a thing. Dot current dot. So I did this before where I hooked up a bunch of events automatically. I could have sworn that was in event system. But then again, that was also like a full major version of Unity back. So, I mean, who knows? Uh, Unity engine dot event. Systems. I could have sworn there was a thing for that.
Yeah, okay. Um, button dot get component event trigger. I should be able to grab this. And this should have a delegates.add new event trigger entry. The problem is this isn't going to On select has um, where the hell did selectable go? I closed it. Um, button selectable on select and on deselect just take this base event data. Now this has the selected object. Okay, good. Well, I guess otherwise, I mean, I could have just taken it from the event system current selected object, but depending on the execution order, that could be a bit of a mess. So, private void on node selection base event data start on node selection. Oh, yeah. Oh, hang on. Let me pop back here to this code I'm looking at. Yeah, okay. So, can't just do this. And it is delegates.add, right? I was right about that. Yeah, I'm totally, I was totally right about that. Good. But... Event trigger dot delegates is obsolete. Please use triggers instead. Okay, fine. Triggers dot add. Jeez, come on now. All right, so that's fine. Button dot on click dot remove all listeners when we apply the style. Uh, this is super inefficient because, well, in this case, though, I do want to remove all the listeners for this uh, for this piece, but I don't want to keep adding listeners here. But I can't trust that there aren't other on select event triggers hidden behind the scenes that could affect our natural navigation. So. How do I do this? Add listener, invoke, remove listener. Override method info. I mean, really. And this entry is a class and not a struct, so I can keep this by reference. Yeah. Uh, 
I need to create this before anything else, so we'll throw this in the awake. This is getting seriously a little janky here, but I'm going to flush this out and then I'll clean it up. Um, I might clean it up afterwards if I don't like where I ended up. Do I get a contains? I do. And let's see what happens. It'll probably explode everywhere. And nothing's firing. Um, huh. There's probably no... I mean, is event trigger a thing I can add here? Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the deal. So, let's look at my prefab that I'm using for all these. I can add that there. And look at that. Our selection's occurring. Hot damn. Our selection occurs on click down, our click event occurs on click up. All right, so that's perfect. Well, actually, hang on here. We do need to make sure we're not doubling up. So I click that, attack three selected. If I pop back in here again. If I pop back in here again, though, it maintains my navigation, even though the state isn't set. You can see I'm, I'm focused on attack two when I come in, and I hit down, it goes to attack three come back in, it's not in the selected state. Yeah, okay. So, that's one thing. So apply styles. We have on node selection which doesn't occur when I first pop the screen. So it just, it maintains the focus internally. Um, available skill clicked, purchase skill clicked, that stuff doesn't really help me. So if this initially selected control is not equal to null, then do that. I actually want to do this. 
So I was doing it there. I actually want to do this on enable. I think that's the deal, right? Once I've applied all the styles and everything. Uh, same, same problem. Uh, what if we do one of those? No, it doesn't do anything. But we are now um, always refocusing back to the top left, our initially select con selected control being the bash object. But for the moment, let's, let's finish things out here with the navigation. So on node selection, I need to take my viewport rect, which I'm gonna need to know about, unlock skills screen controller. He doesn't know about the viewport, but he does. Uh, well, I guess ultimately it's going to be the parent of the child, right? Like every scenario. So first off, uh, if I could spell transform viewport. And I don't really care about the transform so much as I care about the rec transform. This dot viewport rect is equal to this dot transform dot parent dot get component rec transform. Now the rec transforms are always a little squirrely to deal with, at least uh, at least I think so. Uh, where's my selected node? thing. There you are. So viewport rec dot What do I get with a rec transform? Anchored position offset pivot size on get local corners, get world corners, reapply driven properties. Well, what do I really want to set here? So let's take a closer look at the transform while we're using it. So my viewport is going to be a stretch with a zero zero. Bottom pivot is point pivot is halfway in on either side, so it's pivot center stretch. What changes? Well, that's less than helpful. Nothing changed. my current transform is changing. Let's uh let's split this here. Split the difference. So scene field one So unlock skills with our viewport and our content. So the viewport's actually remaining completely still. Right, we're not moving the viewport, we're moving the actual whole screen. At least that's what the transform would indicate.
Oh god, what was my layout initially? <laughs> no. There we go. There's my layout. Vertical split console. Um, huh. Okay, so... So we actually don't give a damn about changing the viewport rect. We only care about changing this rect. And we need to move it until the object is within view. So let's get rid of this. I don't care about viewport. I only care about this dot transform. Well, I do care about viewport because I need to know when the object is in the viewport. So what do I have as far as being in view? Yeah, they're just doing transformation. Yeah, get world corners. Wait, does rect transform have a contains method that takes another rect? It's an extension. No, okay, damn. I was very excited for a second there. In that case, what's this thing they're looking at? If screen rect contains, and they are looking at their screen rect is just a rectangle. Okay, gotcha. Screen width and screen height. Yeah, that's super limited. Uh, all right, so, so what? Um, what about my scroll rectangle? I got this guy for a reason. What does he have for me? The elasticity, flexible height, all those things that are settable in the editor. Movement type, normalized position, vector 2. Zero, 0, being the lower left corner, 1, 1 being the top right. Okay. Uh, preferred height with scroll sensitivity. I can get the viewport and the view rect from that. How about just a scroll into view or something like that? That'd be nice. Rebuild. Uh, and these are all public virtual, so I can at least access them. Set layout. I can stop movement immediately. That's useful. Set content anchored position. Set dirty. Nothing particularly useful. You can set the vertical normalized position, and I'm assuming there's a horizontal normalized position in here somewhere. So we could go from 0 to 1 to snap between different positions, but 
I mean, quite frankly, without being able to detect if the object is in view, it doesn't really help me too much. How about you, Internet? Do you have anything else for me? Anything useful? Unity manual. Unity 3, skull wrecked. Uh, focus control. I don't know. Moving a scroll wreck child via script to focus on some point. No answers. Uh, can a scroll wreck snap to elements? Uh, that's just about dragging things. Um, how to position scroll wreck to another item. Yeah, this is the one I was looking at earlier. Try setting the normalized position to where it would reveal the transform. Okay, I'm I'm fine with this. Public scroll racked show in tab control. Okay, I guess he was making a tab. Normalized position is equal to the transform dot get sibling index divided by the child count. Well, I mean, that assumes that the children are in order based on position. That's not great, but let's see. Yeah, this guy's kind of going with it for some reason, even though that doesn't make sense. It makes sense if you're using like a vertical layout panel or something like that. But I mean, quite frankly, I'm not. So I guess I need an order of things based on, but that also assumes a uniform distance between elements, not in this, not even just that the index is in order. So no, that, that doesn't solve my problem, but they are assigning normalized position as though that moves the rect automatically, so that is at least part of the answer. Um, and do they have anything else interesting in here? The answer is no, it does not appear to be. Definitely one of those times where it's like, couldn't they have just written this for me? <laughs> Why can't this just be built into Unity? But, I mean, quite frankly, I haven't seen too many scenarios where people are actually using this scroll rect thing. Like, it, it's definitely the least covered as far as the, um, the videos I see in my YouTube uh, subscriptions or, you know, any articles I come across. Like previously, uh, for, for one of my previous titles, I did a paginated uh, UI panel, meaning there's a next and previous button and it swaps out sets of uh, child elements. In this case, it was, a, it was a shop, but that was kind of a, that was a bitch and a half to get that to work because I had to do a lot of, a lot of weird shenanigans involving the, um, the update cycle and forcing updates and, you know, force, to force the layout to position things and then you know, kind of get the children and determine how many children can actually be on the screen based on the automatic sizing and the resolution, and it was a whole mess. And I do still want to clean that up a bit and throw that up on the asset store or something, but I mean, quite frankly, I just don't have time for that right now.
All right, so I mean, realistically here, I've got my viewport. Okay, I've got my viewport and I've got my control here, and he has a you know height, width, bottom, and these guys all have positions, and I know the selected item, so I know his position within the rectangle. Oh, the problem is the the anchoring is different. So, I mean, if I know the top is zero and the bottom is 278, and I know that in this case, all right, so let's look at rec transform again. Anchored position, anchored max, anchored min, pivot, rect, size delta. I'm gonna grab some of this information. I'm gonna display a little bit of this. So debug.log.data.selectedobject.transform Dot position. Let's just see what the position and local positions. Ooh. T dot anchored position, local position, position. These are from transform, so those will be the same. Uh, rectangle, yeah. Debug dot log anchored position, anchor max. What else do I want? Um, yeah, let's just see what I get from this. So position, local position, wrecked and anchored position. What are you yelling about? Uh, it's all builds fine. One fifteen four seventy. This is stun bash. Yeah, so 115, 470 is my position. Local position is negative 436, 299. Rect is. Yeah, rect and anchored position are the next two. So rect is negative 84.50, negative 30. Width is 169, height is 60. So those match, but 115, negative 150. Okay, so anchored position is based on this anchor, is based on the top left anchor. Rect is based on what? Like, what is this based on? Negative 84, negative 30? Negative 84, negative 30. Negative 84 and a half. It's the same every time. So rect is pretty much useless as far as I can tell. Uh, position and local position though. Um, 
So 886 by 44. Eight eighty six by six hundred. I need this thing to continue scrolling clear. Dash is three thirty four by five sixty, one fifteen by five sixty, eight eighty six by five sixty. So those are relative coordinates. Eight sixty six, yeah, and it's going down three eighty negative one sixteen. So this is based on the position within the canvas. As soon as it zooms down, it goes to a negative. No, actually, it's a yeah, yeah. It drops to negative one sixteen. Well, it drops to a negative 116, but my transform says the bottom is negative 278. Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. All right. I have no clue what to do with that. <laughs> All right, so that actually didn't take too much longer to get sorted out. I was able to find a bit of code online that kind of detailed a little bit more, um, more concisely uh, how to solve the problem. I was finding a lot of stuff that was like, you know, 80 lines of code and it's this huge thing. It's like, oh my God, this math looks, um, looks squirrely as all hell. Like, I really don't think this is correct. And then I found a guy that was, you know, hey, yeah, you can solve this with a few lines of code. It, um, it doesn't solve it exactly as I want it to. I think I can go from here and experiment a little bit further and kind of get it to where I want it to do. But first off, let me just show you what it does. Now, I've added a few extra um, nodes in here that are fake, just so I can kind of navigate back and forth. And they're all misaligned, so the navigation's a little bit weird as far as where do I go from here when I press down, it goes to attack three. If I press down again, it goes to this one down here that's off screen. So it's a little strange. And then when I press up again, it goes to attack three here instead of this one, right? So down from this element goes all the way down here because it's the next one to the left that's below the object. And when I press up, this middle attack three is the next one that's to the right that's above. And I think that's how it works, but I'm not 100% on that. Yet when I press up again, it goes up here to this dash instead of back up here or over here. It's very strange. So I'm not quite 100% on this navigation deal. But as you can see, it's it snaps so that items are in view. What I don't like is that even though these two are in view together, it still pans the entire view to go up. And the code that I'm using seems to treat the maximum up value, a vertical normalized position of one is the top, as kind of the, the target. Like this is kind of the, the math is specifying that this is the default and we're only going to go down if we have to. Now, Yeah, so that's that's more or less it. There's no like, it's not a smooth transition or anything like that. And what I had discovered also is that if you, um, well, I'll show you the code here. So we get our selected item, our um, rec transform for the selected item. And from that we derive a scroll percentage. And this is the percentage of the view based on let me just pull this back up here. We grab our selected item local position Y, and we take that position as a percentage of the 
the total Y value between our viewport rect and our total content size. So what that kind of means is we want to know the local position Y of this guy as a ratio of the viewport height minus the height of the total thing here. And then we're going to take this and we're going to normalize this and when I say normalize, I use normalize in the way the other guy used normalize, which is not actually the technically the appropriate usage. Like we're, we're making this percentage a factor of our viewport as a whole. And we are doing this one minus in order to relate it more to terms in, in the sense that our top is one and our bottom is zero. So we're doing this to kind of flip that around. As I understand it anyways, I'm no mathematician. And because this vertical is between zero to one, I do a little math f dot clamp. Which if you don't do the clamp, something actually pretty interesting happens. So I'm gonna pop that there. And if you look, You know, what we're going to see here is as I go down, the whole panel comes down and it like the viewport is still the same, but instead of just scrolling to the part of the panel, we're just sliding the whole thing around without, while well, ignoring this um, uh, movement type item for clamped, it's actually treating it as if it's um, unrestricted. So that's important to note that this vertical normalized position actually overrides the, the uh, movement type that you've selected. And that's more or less it. Like, I mean, there's a few problems there, but this does solve the issue of our gamepad. And I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna think about this a little bit more and come up with something a little more elegant. But I think that's a good, uh, good way to cap this session. So thank you for watching, and you know, once again, have a great day.